So greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Isabel Chowdhury, and I am the Senior Policy Manager at the National Women's Health Network. Welcome to this webinar, exploring the intersections of hair discrimination, chemicals and cosmetics in women's health. I will be moderating the discussion today. And the purpose of this discussion is to unpack the intersecting issues and connections between hair discrimination, chemicals and cosmetic products and women's health. I will try my best to reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions from attendees at the very end. So to start us off, I will provide a brief background of the issue. The human right to wear one's hair in its natural state is not protected for Black women and girls. This lack of protection is harmful and it is rooted in historically racist practices of controlling Black women's bodies. Black women and girls have been forced to adjust, chemically alter and change their natural hair in order to conform to workplace and school policies that prioritize Eurocentric beauty norms. These Eurocentric beauty standards favor straight hairstyles and discriminate against natural hairstyles to the detriment of natural hair and Black women's health. Efforts to avoid discrimination by conforming to Eurocentric beauty standards place Black women and girls at an increased risk of exposure to toxic chemicals found in cosmetic products, including hair products. Compared with white women, black women have higher levels of beauty product related environmental chemicals in their bodies, independent of socioeconomic status. Studies suggest that even small exposures to toxic chemicals during critical periods of development, such as pregnancy, can trigger adverse health consequences, such as impacts on fertility, pregnancy, neurodevelopment, and cancer. So through this one hour discussion between experts on various aspects of this issue, we will unpack and outline how these issues impact Black women's health, as well as what solutions both at the federal level and grassroots level are available for communities at risk. So our panelists today include India Beal, who is a visual artist, curator, and author, Dr. Ami Zoda, who is a professor uh, associate Professor at George Washington University Milken School of Public Health, Dr. Astrid Williams, who is an Environmental Justice and Reproductive Health Manager at Black Women for Wellness, Kareen Taylor, who is a Director of Federal Legislative Affairs at We Act for Environmental Justice. So I'm very excited to have you all in this discussion. And I want to start with India, Bill, but before we get into your work and the questions or your presentation, can you briefly tell us how you got involved in this issue? Definitely. First of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. It is an honor to join these amazing women, especially during Women's History Month. So thank you for that. Um, so my uh, work really focuses on women of color within corporate spaces. Um, over an 11 year period, I used photography and video to talk about the experiences of being a woman of color, but most importantly, how to use art in terms of social justice. Um, a lot of the work stemmed from my own personal experiences in the corporate space where I was othered. Um, I was the elephant in the room that everyone saw, but no one was talking to or listening to. And so I turned the camera on my own experiences and realized that my own personal truth could be universally translated in a way that I'd never imagined, where people across genders and race could understand the experiences of women of color through photography and video within the corporate space. So that's kind of the kind, I guess, summary of the type of work that I'm making. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am a big fan of your work. I love your work. <laughs> um, and I wanna start with the social impacts of this issue as I sort of briefly outline. And you highlight much of this in your work. For example, in your series, Am I What You're Looking For? You focus on young African-American women who are transitioning from the academic world to the corporate setting, capturing their struggles and uncertainties about how best to present themselves in the per professional space. Um, so right now, I'll just allow you to uh, share your screen and sort of unpack your work on this and outline how Black women face hair discrimination while navigating through the workplace. 
Definitely. So I'm going to actually show you all two different bodies of work that all kind of come together in my book, Performance Review. The first body of work I'm going to call, tell you is Can I Touch It, um, which is actually the name is a little provocative in itself. I found myself as a student, a graduate student at Yale School of Art, so I was at Yale University, and I was working in the IT department. And I normally have a big afro. I mean, my afro is so big, it might cover this entire screen in terms of my hair. And I'm also very tall as well. And so um, that became a, a point of conversation for many of my white and female colleagues at my job. Uh, the women would come up to me and say, you know, girl, how'd your hair get like that? Or my, can my hair do that? Or can I touch it? And I realized that my own personal space was being invaded based on something that was connected to me, which is my look, my hair. So I said, you know what? Why don't we try it? Why don't I give you this look? I can do that for you. And I said, really? I said, yes. However, if I give you this hairstyle, you have to let me take a corporate portrait of you. And they said, well, why a corporate portrait? I said, because we're gonna question conformity. When I go to an interview with my natural hair, I never get the job, never, ever. And so I become militant or angry or political before I even open my mouth, it has nothing to do with my resume. And so we're gonna work together to question conformity. So I'll show you guys, uh, can I touch it? I'm gonna share my screen. And Isabel, if you can just let me know, can you see my screen? Yes, okay, cool. So can I touch it? Um, so I gave these women these traditional black hairstyles, all the hairstyles I've ever had in my life and had them take these corporate portraits. Now, at the time when I did this series, I assumed that these white women had no idea what I was talking about in terms of having to change yourself to fit into a space that was never designed for you. I was wrong. Not only did they understand having gone through this experience, but they learned about their own experiences, their own perspectives. So for instance, this is Desiree. Um, Desiree is actually of mixed race. Her mother is white, her father is black. And when she started working in the corporate space, they asked her to change her name. They said that Desiree was too exotic and that Anne would be more fitting for her at her job. So I gave these women these hairstyles, but even during this experience, we talked about what does it mean to change? What does it mean to alter certain aspects of yourself? Now, there is a certain degree of humor uh, to this work, which for me was an undertone that I needed in the work. You know, a lot of times when you're talking about something so um, personal, you're either going to cry or you may laugh. And so for me, allowing my viewer to kind of understand the work, but more importantly, to realize that it's kind of ridiculous that we had to change certain aspects of who we are to fit into these spaces that were never designed for us to thrive in the first place. Uh, many people ask me, did the women like the hairstyles? No, hell no, they did not like these hairstyles. However, it wasn't about liking a hairstyle. The point was, is that these women allowed me to make them the other for a moment in order to understand what it feels like to be in a space that was never designed for you. And so in making this work, it was really about that experience of using these white women to talk about the experiences of black women. Now, Isabel, you talked about the Am I What You're Looking For series. I used to work at a HBCU, which is a historically black college and university for people who don't know in the audience. And my students would come to me, not to talk about their academics or their classes, but to talk about their interviews. They said, you know, Professor Beal, I went to an interview and the man asked me, do I normally wear my hair that way? Or I went to an interview and they asked me, could they buy my hair in the store? Or I went to an interview and they said, you know what? You have, a, I see you have a little bit of discoloration on your face. Would you mind covering your face more with your hair, meaning straighten it, so that way people wouldn't see certain things. And I'm not talking about this is not happening in 1990, 1995. This happened in 2018, 2017, 2020. And so my students and I made a series together called Am I What You're Looking For? The backdrop that you see in this photograph is the hallway I walked down at Yale every day, the hallway that I had where I was at work, where I was a spectacle, the elephant in the room. I photographed the students in the house they grew up in. I wanted them to feel comfortable. They're not models. And so I wanted them to feel as authentic as possible. I said, I want you to wear whatever you deem professional. I didn't dictate their clothing. And I said, I want you to pretend you're the only woman, the only black person in the space. How would you feel in that moment? 
here's Sabrina and Katrina. They say, you know what, Miss Beal, if they didn't like my hairstyle at a job, I wouldn't want to work for them. That's a very millennial mindset in terms of how even myself, how I was brought up to think about assimilating into this culture. There are 30 photographs in all. The first 15 were published by the New York Times and then the rest were published by Huffington Post and Vice Magazine. I told the students not to read the comment section um, when these photographs were published because I knew they were gonna be judged. You see, these women have not entered the corporate space. They're students. And even though they were showing their authentic selves, they were still judged. Her hair is too wild. Her pants or her, her, her heels are too, are too tall. All these different things, all these judgments in the comment section. But in many ways, they were activating the work. Here's Keandra and her sister Shakia. She said, you know, India, there's not a certificate I can read or a book that I can get to make me more of a white man. I am or I'm not. Both of these women had to change their names on their resumes in order to receive callbacks from employers. And so again, for me, making this series, focusing on this work, is, is, is about showing the environment, understanding that these women come from these homes, that their parents have prepared them in many ways to, to gain opportunities within corporate sectors. But these women cannot change their hairstyle or their blackness. And those are the things that are scrutinized during interviews and opportunities. And so, like I said, my book, Performance Review, these are just two chapters in the day of the life of a woman of color at work. Um, each body of work, there are over seven bodies of work in the entire book, really focus on different aspects of what it means to work in these spaces, to experience microaggressions, but most importantly, to talk about the human experience of feeling othered, of feeling insecure, of feeling unseen, of feeling invisible, I think that's something we can all relate to in one aspect in our life. Um, and so that's pretty much a uh, performance review, but most importantly, the two bodies of work um, that I'm presenting today. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was really great. And it really outlined the overview of how we get into this issue of uh, the intersecting issue of hair discrimination and cosmetics. Um, so I'm gonna shift over to Dr. Amizoda and before, uh, we get into your question. Can you tell us about your research and work on this issue? Sure. So um, I'm a public health, I'm an environmental public health scientist. Um, so I work a lot with numbers and I do, you know, kind of population level studies to understand kind of how um, we as people are exposed to environmental chemicals and kind of what are the ways they may cause harm. Um, but <laughs> Um, you know, my work doesn't end there. Um, I'm very committed to translating the science for action, especially policy. And the longer I've been in this work and in this field, I realized, you know, there's a big emphasis on individual risk factors, you know, what's something they would call lifestyle factors, right? Whether it's diet or exercise, or um, in this space, like the individual products that women or men or children may use. Um, so, right, this very individualistic framing um, but it kind of ignores, um, you know, the social and economic factors, right, that drive product use. And um, so kind of over time, I've been um, almost like playing a social scientist on TV, but really calling attention to um, upstream factors, um, systems of oppression, really trying to bring a, a racial analysis uh, to this work on uh, cosmetics, chemicals of harm, and, and women's health. Um, and so that's where my work has been going, always with an eye towards um, what can we do about it? What are, where are the levers of change? And, um, and how can th the science be used um, you know, as a lever of change? Thank you. Um, so to start, you know, India just highlighted how the pressures to meet your eccentric beauty standards really impact black and brown women. Um, and then we find that black women are using more beauty products and thus are exposed to higher levels of chemicals known to be harmful to health. And we know black women suffer uh, more from anxiety about having a bad hair day and they're twice as likely to experience social pressure to straighten their hair hair products like straighteners or relaxers are likely to contain toxic chemicals. And 
um, they have higher levels of estrogen and can, and can trigger premature reproductive development in young girls and possibly tumors. Can you define the environmental uh, injustice of beauty and why you thought this framing was important and relevant to the conversation about black hair discrimination and black women's health? Yeah, and um, I just want to kind of commend uh, India. I, I really enjoyed uh, your comments and your images, and um, and you know I think there's kind of a um, a complementariness, you know, to kind of what you're doing in this visceral way with images and um, some of the frameworks and language we're trying to kind of connect to this body of work. Um, so the environmental injustice of beauty was a, a framework that um, I kind of have co-developed with Dr. Bhavna Shamasunder. Um, and it was really to kind of put this issue in a environmental justice framework, um, you know, really kind of pointing to social and historical forces that shape the rituals and our thoughts about ourselves around beauty. And um, one, you know, I think kind of what's critical to this is, is intersectionality. Um, which is a critical theoretical framework, you know, comes out of the black feminist literature um, developed by Kimberly Crenshaw to address synergistic experiences of black women who endure multiple forms of oppression, uh, such as racism and sexism, right? It's not an either or, it's multiplicative. And I think that that really, um, you know, is very relevant to the topic at hand. So, in the environmental justice of beauty, you know, we kind of posited that elevated exposures to beauty product chemicals and women of color um, are attributable to this environmental injustice of beauty. So it's a framework that links intersectional systems of oppression. And so here I'm talking about racism, sexism, classism to racialize beauty practices, which in turn lead to unequal environmental exposures and poor health. And, um, you know, to be really explicit, due to historical and ongoing racial discrimination and cultural imperialism, you know, this is a global phenomenon. Um, there's a hierarchy of global beauty norms that prioritizes whiteness and white femininity at the top of that pyramid, right? That is the norm that everyone is implicitly or explicitly striving towards. And so when we talk about black hair discrimination, you know, this is an example where racism, sexism, and classism are intersecting. Um, because as India mentioned, Black women are often penalized for wearing their hairs in natural styles, especially in the workplace, um, where some employers, employers discourage or even prohibit natural hairstyles worn by Black women. And um, this form of intersectional discrimination can ne negatively impact professional opportunities for Black women and consequently their long-term wealth. Um, and so as, as you all know, to comply with these racialized beauty norms, um, black women may feel pressure to straighten their hair or, or use certain type of products, many of which contain harmful environmental chemicals. And um, you know, one such example is um, in the black women's health study, hair relaxer use was associated with increased risk of uterine fibroids. Um, so um, that's just one example, but there, but there's many others. So I think it's just helpful to kind of think about, you know, the kind of how these 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 systems of oppression that 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 kind of we live in, how they end up affecting, um, you know, this everything down to the cells in our bodies and how our bodies are are responding to these to these different layers of um, toxicants. Thank you. And can you sort of highlight? or go over how these chemicals end up in our bodies and discuss um, some of the chemicals that are, or exposures and beauty related chemicals that are um, more so found in black women hair products and end up in our bodies. Sure, yeah. And there's, you know, kind of a group of scientists that have been, been working on this, including Dr. Tamara James Todd, Silent Spring Institute, um, scientists and, um, you know, there's kind of a community of folks. Um, but um, so the work by Dr. Tashari, um, uh, Chandra Tashari years ago was the first work to kind of show how use of hair relaxers, especially early on, can lead to kind of premature uh, signs of puberty, even in, in young girls. And, and that once you stop the product use, that those kind of uh, the biological trigger, the biological aging kind of slow down. And that was kind of the first kind of compelling data 
um, that really kind of brought this, you know, kind of attention because I think a lot of people would just think, well, you know, if these products are on the shelf, sure they should, you know, should be safe. Um, some work done by the Silent Spring Institute maybe two or three years ago explicitly tested products marketed to Black women and children. They found that all products had fragrances. And the problem with fragrances is it's like a whole slew of chemicals, many of which are unregulated and don't have to be disclosed. Um, and that the, the levels were kind of on the higher range of what's typically found in hair products. They found higher levels of certain parabens, um, which are endocrine disruptors and can mimic estrogen, especially in cream-based products, um, nonophenols, which are, um, you know, have kind of been implicated in, in kind of a breast cancer kind of um, disease etiology, as well as a phthalate. And some of the products, um, you know, some of the hair care products that really stood out were root stimulators, hair relaxers, and hair lotions. Um, and the other one, which has been a little bit off the radar, is also flame retardants that are used in um, weaves and extensions to mm -hmm. make artificial hair fire retardant. Um, and, um, and so that one has been less well studied. So, I mean, in terms of the pathway, we're both concerned about just leave-in products that sit on your scalp because they can be absorbed. The other thing is just these products getting on your hands and then, right, you, you either put your hands in your, your mouth, right, on your face, or you touch food. So it's called like hand-to-mouth ingestion. And then um, for like fragrances, um, you know, if you apply a product um, like in a bathroom, it can actually volatilize into the air and you, you can breathe it in. So even the example, I'm sure all of you know that skin lighteners can have mercury, well, mercury vapors can volatilize. Um, and there's been cases like investigations of people trying to find the source of the high mercury when they go into the homes, you know, they go into the bathroom and the mercury is just sitting there um, kind of in the airspace. So um, there, there's a kind of a couple of different pathways to think about. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pivot over to Dr. Astrid Williams um, and I may get back to you, Dr. Zoda. Um, can you tell us about your role at Black Women for Wellness before we get into your questions? Hi, welcome. Thank you for having me here and just really glad to be able to contribute to this discussion because it's definitely a worthy cause um, that we all face as women of color. And so as the environmental justice and reproductive manager at Black Women for Wellness in Los Angeles, California, our goal and mission is to outreach to black women and girls to advocate for them and their needs, their well-being, their health. And so this is a very uh, important topic that we're discussing. You know, um, both presenters have touched on, you know, great things in terms of, you know, how we're deemed in society, the societal norms, um, how Dr. Ami was mentioning about, you know, some of the products that we use and the exposures. And so we work with a lot of the Black hair care professionals in the South LA or Los Angeles area in general. And we have a plethora of information that we are, have available that we are, you know, um, distributing to the community about this topic as well. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, my first question is that research shows that salon workers are at greater risk for certain health problems compared with other occupations. Salon workers face disproportionate incidence of cancer, neurological diseases, immune diseases, birth defects, reproductive disorders, skin diseases, asthma, um, and breathing problems. So with the exception of the smaller barber force, which is largely um, made up of men, salon workers are predominantly women and women of color. So what is your biggest concern for salon workers and the ones that may be exposed to uh, chemicals like endocrine disruptors and what conditions do they work in? Meaning, do they have access to protective equipment? And if they do, are these effective? Yeah, so protective personal equipment has been known to be effective in reducing exposure to some of these toxic chemicals and um, substances that they come across, um, whether it be hair dyes, um, shampoos, conditioner, hair relaxers, all of those have, you know, um, as you mentioned, endocrine um, disruptor chemicals, compounds, other things that can disrupt our, you know, reproductive system and our health in general for um, those that are taking those types of um, 
ingredients in the products that they use. So it's very important to educate uh, the um, industry professionals about how they can, you know, safeguard themselves against these chemicals, um, whether it be gloves, um, face shields, aprons, um, proper ventilation, you know, within the salon or the areas that they're working in so that they don't have, you know, um, as much as the exposures for that. And so we work with these professionals to be able to provide these personal um, protection equipment so that they can, you know, um, have the um, resources that they need to equip themselves themselves um, in the industry that they work in. And uh, beauty products, which is just one category of personal care products, have limited and inconsistent disclosure of chemical ingredients and most lack adequate data on the health and safety, which is why a lot of people you know, are unaware of this issue. Why are endocrine disrupting chemicals still being used in hair products despite growing concern? And which popular brands should folks be avoiding? And which are safe, if you know? <laughs> yes. So um, consumers, um, particularly since our audience that we're talking about, Black women are using it, um, the hair, uh, hair dyes. Uh, relaxers because we want to look good. You know, we as um, India refer to, you know, the societal norms when we go into these job interviews or when we're in the work, you know, uh, environment or wherever it is, we have to conform to these societal standards. So that is one of the issues at large, why they're still continuing to use some of um, these certain products. And so endocrine disruptors, uh, as we know, as endocrine um, disrupting chemicals can be very harmful um, to the reproductive, you know, system also to um, our sexual health. Studies have shown in utero, even the mother that um, uses these products can be very harmful um, to the child as well. And so it's very important to bring education and awareness, um, not to get into any particular brands, but what we like to do is to educate the consumers to read the labels, um, to look for um, different things. We have chemical cards or chem cards for short, that we give out to the um, community that you know highlights some of the products to steer clear from so that they can become more familiar with some of these um, ingredients. Also, there's apps that you know you can use on your phone. Um, so if you download um, those apps, and so there's two that come to mind, uh, the Detox Me app and also the EWG Environmental Working Group has apps where you can put in you know, the product that you're using and it'll give you a rating about you know how clean the product is. And so that's also um, an extension of how we can bring greater awareness with the consumers. Okay, that sort of gets into my next question about what efforts have been made to engage and educate parents and women, children on the effects of these products. Yes, yeah, so education and awareness is very important. And some of these, you know, um, products are started at a very young age. And so if we look at the lifespan that they're exposed to from, you know, um, uh, young ages, you know, as far as, you know, five or six and going into, you know, late or mid adulthood. And so education is very important. I know I don't want to say that it's a trend now. Hopefully it's not a trend and something that, you know, we adopt as a lifestyle by going into more natural hairstyles, you know, um, that don't include, you know, a lot of the, you know, highly processed chemicals such as relaxers and dyes. And so looking at safer alternatives to style your hair. And so um, we would like to educate the mothers, you know, the parents, about you know some of these brands that are out there, what chemicals not to include um, in their styling techniques, and also how to style hair naturally. You know, braids or protective styles, as we like to say, are a great way to care for your hair, especially for younger um, women and children. Thank you. Um, that was very helpful. I'm going to pivot to Kareen. Um, could you tell us about your role at We Act and this issue before we get into your questions? Yeah, good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Kareen Taylor, Director of Federal Legislative Affairs for We Act uh, for Environmental Justice. We Act is a grassroots EJ org based in Harlem, Northern Manhattan. Um, and I work um, in DC in the Federal Policy Office. And I just come to this work generally, um, genuinely is just a black woman very interested and invested in the health and well-being of our communities. And um, when we think about all the ways that we're impacted, it, it's hard to not acknowledge the environmental impact. So when we talk about our environment, it's not just um, you know the trees and the polar bears, but it's everywhere you are. It's where you work, live, 
play, pray, go to school. And unfortunately, the environment of communities of colors, um, communities of color is particularly uh, more polluted than any other community. So our work is to advocate um, in at the state, in the city, and now at the federal level around policies to impact um, the health of communities. Thank you. Um, so we've talked about these harmful toxic chemicals and hair discrimination. Um, can you, I wanna shift to the policy aspect of this issue. Can you talk about why there's a lack of federal over, oversight in cosmetic policy? Awesome, yep, I can definitely do that. So the federal law that governs the $84 billion cosmetic industry um, is over 81 years old. So imagine all of the new products that have just been invented or created in the last 10 years. All of that is regulated by a um, um, regulation that's two and a half pages long and it's close to hundred years old. So already that speaks to the lack of oversight and um, acknowledgement of just the, the thousands of chemicals that people are exposed to every single day. Um, there's some data that shows that the average person is exposed or uses about 12 products a day, which could very well expose them to close to 200 um, unique chemicals just you know, at their skin level, et cetera. And so when we think about the work that the FDA does, we're assuming that the products that are on the shelves that we're buying um, are regulated and, the, and they're safe, but unfortunately due to the lack of oversight and the, the, the decades long backlog, there has not been the update to the FDA regs on um, our, our products uh, that we really need to make sure that they truly are safe for not only ourselves, but for our children. Very true. And so we, so the general um, theme of this discussion is intersection. Can you talk about the environmental or how environmental injustice intersects with toxic cosmetics and hair discrimination? Sure. So we act, um, again, we look at a whole host of issues from transportation to um, the food that we eat, um, to air quality uh, and all of these things, but we also have a campaign called Beauty Inside Out. And the work that we've been doing, and we've actually been in uh, coordination with Dr. Ami Zoda for a very long time in terms of educating young women particularly about their choices and how that impacts their health. We just finished um, some internal uh, surveying of, of, of young women in, in the North Manhattan community to kind of understand um, why they choose the products that they do. And so, um, when we think about just the federal impact of that, my work is then to look at like, what kind of legislation do we need in place to protect people? What kinds of laws do we need to have in place? Because what's happening, and we've been talking about it quite a bit in terms of the intersectionality of it, society through racism, um, through the um, economic impacts of, of you know applying for a job, going to school, et cetera, all of these structural institutions have um, a negative impact on how black people show up um, and, and the in the options that we have. So, you know, while all of us on this Zoom, you know, are having, you know, natural hair and braids, the vast majority is a, of us for decades have had to make these very tough decisions, not even thinking about the health impacts, but, you know, you have to get a job, you, um, you have to go to school, and I have to show up a certain way that's acceptable by society. So if that's a hot comb back in the day, or a relaxer, or a whole host of things, those choices not only impact and prevent us from showing up, you know, economically in terms of the job opportunities, but then those choices then have a direct impact to our health. And so that's when we're seeing um, all of these exposures, you know, um, we've been talking about like Ami mentioned the cream based types of uh, products like pink moisturizer, you know, that's something so many of us grew up with is, you know, oh, you know, I want to make my hair moist and, you know, make it soft, but so many chemicals, you know, the fragrance, the parabens that were mentioned, all of those things are entering our bodies. When we think about our skin and how all of our pores are open after you take a shower, all of that, when you're putting these products on your skin and you aren't aware of what's in them, how does it impact you? And so when we think about those intersectionalities the economic impact, the health impact, it's critical that we have legislation that not, not only pr uh, protects us from, um, from this type of discrimination as it relates to opportunity, but to health. And, it, and, and I think that's why the Crown Act is very important in, in, in addition to a number of, of other pieces of legislation that we've been a part of. 
Yeah, and can you talk about the Crown Act, um, the Creating a Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair Act? It was introduced um, December 2019 by Representative Richmond. So how does the act extend protections against workplace discrimination, particularly as it relates to hair? Sure, and so the Crown Act, act specifically pro prohibits the denial of employment and educational opportunities based on hair texture, including hair that's tightly coiled, um, afros, et cetera. And what I really love about the actual bill is that things that we, you know, how we want to um, style our hair is included in that language. Like there's actual language that speaks to cornrows, locks, twists, braids, bantu knots, afros, et cetera. And it's clear that, you know, the, 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 the authors of it had us in mind. And it, it, it speaks to that no individual in the United States shall be excluded from participation in um, the, not, the denial of benefits or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance based on that individual's hair texture or style. And so that's very um, strong language that we definitely can identify in and see ourselves in. And so the bill was introduced in December of 2019. It had 63 co-sponsors and it passed the House. And then it was um, brought over to the Senate, but it hadn't moved. And so now we have to think, what do we need to do now to get it across the finish line? Yeah, and so what are some challenges and opportunities that exist in this current Congress to do that? Well, let's be real, elections have consequences and some of the consequences are in our favor with us now having um, a 50-50 split in the Senate. Um, we also still have a, a very small uh, majority in the House, but we have the, uh, the deciding vote in our uh, Madam Vice, Vice President um, Kamala Harris, the potential for reintroducing the Crown Act in the 117th Congress this year, and then passing it is definitely there, but the window of time is incredibly small. Um, I would say I, I would behoove um, anyone on this call and you know we can think about strategy from a federal perspective, but mm -hmm. it needs to be reintroduced as soon as possible so that we can take, a, take advantage of the momentum that we have with having um, a more progressive majority in both the House and the Senate. Okay, very true. And we, we plan to coordinate on those efforts as well. Um, I wanna circle back to the beginning and sort of try to bring this full circle before we um, open up for questions. And so just to go back to India, um, hair discrimination is not a new phenomenon. Um, in the 1976 Supreme Court case, Jenkins v. Blue Cross Mutual Hospital Insurance, the Supreme Court decided that hair was protected under the Civil Rights Act, but this ruling did little to extend protections therefore leaving the discretion to employers. And in the same interview or an interview that you did with Imani Perry um, uh, in 2020, you claim that your project has been in the works for eight years. Um, I just wanna know how has this e issue evolved in the time that you've been working on the project? Right, so over, I would say over the eight years, we have, my team and I have used the work not necessarily just for photography, but using it as a teaching tool for social change. So we actually take this work into the corporate space and we actually provide DE&I workshops and, uh, and keynotes to talk about the experiences of all the women who, who participated in the work over the 10 year period. So there's over 65 women of color um, who participated in this work from, from ages 27 to 80, thinking about their experiences and the similarities over these years that you would think multi-generationally they would have different experiences, but many of the women had the same stories, um, the same issues of discrimination or microaggressions that happened at their job based on how they looked. And so when I was talking to um, Dr. Perry, uh, who's a professor at Princeton, I was telling her that, you know, uh, your hairstyle, your skin color, these are certain things that are part of who you are, right? And having to alter those um, dramatically in order to fit into these spaces is affecting women on so many different levels. Um, and so we talked about this idea of, of, of just kind of how we're taught to kind of assimilate and change for even myself in order to fit into those spaces. And so putting the work in the corporate sector with hiring managers, with human resources, you know, with uh, career services at universities where they're teaching students to prepare for their jobs is letting them say, you know, it's, this is not just a kind of a blanket thing you can do for everybody. Here are some tools you can use that are visual 
that can teach you and educate you on how to address the issues with your students, with your staff, um, with onboarding, so that you're making sure that you're not making the same mistakes. And so over the years, we've kind of seen how this artwork has been an innovative tool in addressing the issues, particularly in uh, corporate sectors. Yeah. Yeah, and I think part of the issue is also that uh, employers and folks don't know about the health implications of uh, cosmetic products and sort of the downward or intersecting um, spiral or, or issue that this causes for a lot of Black women. Um, so Dr. Zoda, can you expand upon the health impacts of chemicals of concern that scientists are finding in products targeted to Black women and children? Yeah, and I think it's important to note that, you know, some of the, pro the, the health effects that are being studied are ones that, you know, where we know there are known health disparities. Um, so preterm birth, um, early a earlier age at puberty, um, right, which is a risk factor for many reproductive uh, type cancers like breast and ovarian cancer, um, as well as uh, infertility. And, uh, and uterine fibroids, among others. So, um, you know, uh, I think reproduction and development are particularly sensitive endpoints for um, a lot of these chemicals that, that, that we're talking about. And um, so I just wanna kind of briefly, you know, cause I always try to use these, um, these webinars as a point of education and just trying to un get people to understand what kind of science there is. So there's both the science that you know, epidemiologic studies where people ask women about their hair product use and then look at how certain hair product use is associated with different health outcomes. And so one example there is women who reported childhood hair oil use mm -hmm. had an earlier risk for, um, you know, risk of earlier age at menarche. So there they're looking specifically at hair oil use and menarche. But then another study, which is kind of com comparable and compatible, but different, actually measure the chemicals, right, that we think are higher in these products. So in this case, they were looking at parabens, some of the phthalates, um, triclosan, and, and there they found that it was actually the prenatal exposures, so the exposures that you have during pregnancy, I mean, at, in utero, right, were, were, were associated with earlier age at menarche. So, you know, 10, 12 years later, that that prenatal window is still so powerful when we're talking about development and reproduction. So just wanna kind of bring up, you know, these are two different types of studies. Um, my own work does, a, my, own, my own work looks a lot at uterine fibroids and fibroid outcomes. And we've done a lot of work, or we've done work on phthalates as a class and uh, kind of both fibroid severity and also getting into like the molecular pathways and you know, actually studying like what's going down at the cellular level in the in the fibroid tumors themselves. Um, so, you know, I just kind of want to highlight that some of this science, it's messy, and it doesn't neatly like fit in a box, because there's different kind of studies. And when you're looking at what we what, what we can measure in the body, we might get like a sense of a snapshot of our exposure, but we can't say, okay, I have this concentration of phthalate in my body and you know 10% of that is because of the hair products i use like we just don't have the tools to be that precise and so i you know when i think about my policy colleagues like isabel and kareen you know i think that has been an impediment is that you know the science is complicated and messy and in sometimes inconclusive but there are still signals there that can be pulled out to to help advance this issue Thank you. And when you say menarche, you're talking about when a girl or when a child first has um, their period, yes. the their period, right? Um, so I, I will shift to Dr. Williams, but I want to start with a quote that uh, was derived from an article um, that you were in, Dr. Soda, where you said that reproductive health professionals must be prepared to counsel patients who have questions about chemical exposures. So my question to you, Dr. Williams, is what are your suggestions about how health professionals should approach this conversation? 
Yes, and so as uh, professionals within the industry, they should be cautious about the products that they come into contact with, um, educated about you know, some of the cleaner alternatives and also hair um, styling techniques to reduce their exposures to these toxins and chemicals. Um, as I mentioned, we work closely with these beauty professionals to educate and also provide protective you know, personal equipment and we engage with them and the community. We have a um, talk or a dialogue called Conversations and Curls that we do on a regular basis. That is to intersect the um, healthcare, or excuse me, the beauty professionals with the consumers and have an open dialogue about, you know, uh, what some of the products that they use and alternatives to these products, how to style your hair naturally. So it's a really good, you know, connection between the two. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important that health professionals are being educated and having conversations with patients about this issue. Um, I'm going to shift back to Kareen. Um, in a future where the Crown Act is passed and enforced, how does the environment of schools and workplace change for Black women? I would think at least there would be an increased awareness on the behalf of employers and educators that they need to think very differently about how um, they choose to respond to something that they're not comfortable with, particularly our hair. You know, we think about um, the women in the military who want to wear braids but might be limited um, and how they've been punished in the past. And if it weren't for the public outcry in response to that, would that have impacted those women's professional career in the military and their ability to move up in rank? We think about, you know, all of the um, students who attend uh, school and the young man who played um, wrestling and they cut his hair before he could compete. All of those kinds of public shaming and then limitations and opportunities. Um, you know, we know for a fact that uh, children in school, whether that be, um, and black children particularly, and black girls particularly, are punished more um, for infractions that are, are rule-based and not necessarily um, are criminal based, but it leads to that school to prison pipeline, et cetera. So having these types of safeguards in place that would um, create, I think, appropriate responses to the things that we think are normal, but according to the broader mainstream society or not, it would, I think, I think begin the process of limiting um, the types of uh, reasons that they would see, you know, school sometimes seek to, to punish students or um, our, our economic and career opportunities are limited. I think the problem and the, the big challenge will be on the implementation side. There are tons of bills that are passed every single day, um, but when it's time to implement them to really see that policy and that structural change, that's gonna be the, the, the challenge. And, and so many things happen um, not only at the national level, but at the local level. But it is exciting to see the number of local bills that are being passed and um, to, to model the Crown Act. I know I think um, some Crown Act legislation just passed yesterday in Connecticut, so, uh, or just on the 8th. So um, it, it, it's, it sets the tone for how a school should respond. And in the case of any kind of discrimination, there's that legal protection in place um, for a student, for a woman, um, and, or anyone who might be discriminated because of their hair. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time now, and I know I promised about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I think I like where we're at right now. So I will open up the chat for questions. And while we get questions, can I add one thing about the health professionals? Yes, of course. Um, you know, I think doctors for many of us are gatekeepers of health information. Um, and, but for a long time, you know, just in terms like they don't like in medical school, they don't really learn about environmental exposures or environmental risk factors. So there's kind of been a disconnect in terms of doctors really understanding the body of evidence. Uh, but there have been some major changes in the last five to seven years, especially among pediatricians and OBGYNs, and especially among OBGYNs, like the professional societies that the doctors belong to. They've kind of released a couple of big statements recognizing kind of how, what a kind of the, 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 the harm from environmental chemicals to reproduction and pregnancy and have actually, um, you know, have in their statements advocated for policies to prevent exposure to toxic environmental chemicals, especially, you know, and in those policies, they explicitly mention environmental justice 
and uh, particular attention to susceptible populations. So I think clinicians um, can be allies in this work and there's been more activation in those communities in the last couple of years. And just to add to that, what um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Zoto just stated for breast cancer, which we know is something that's great of concern within our um, Black community, is that we don't have the highest rates of those who you know um, encounter um, breast cancer, but we do have the most aggressive form, and also the environmental exposures and risk it plays a huge role in you know breast cancer. Um, so again, that just you know begs the you know the whole point about we need to be very cautious and careful about the products. Um, and exposure, environmental exposures in general. So we, ha we actually have a question from um, a doctor who's asking where can uh, he access some of this data so he can be better prepared um, to counsel patients? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one, one program and website would be, and I can put this in the chat, is um, they could go to the program on reproductive health and the environment. Or should I, I don't know how I put that in the chat. Should I send to all panelists and attendees? So they have de developed, a, you know, at least materials on kind of environmental chemical exposures specific for health professionals. Um, and then there are these, also these professional society statements, um, are, I think are good reads and good introduc introductions into the, into the literature because they, they cite a lot of the literature too. Thank you. Um, another question we have is, questions are moving. So as a white woman working in academia within this area, someone wants to know what they can do to support this and are any common mistakes often being made? Anyone can answer. Is she asking about supporting the Crown Act or supporting like her students with natural hair? I'm just curious. Um, I guess it's not clear here, but hold on. No, um, I guess to me, it reads like supporting in general. Well, I think it kind of touched on to what India was saying, can I touch it, right? Oftentimes when we're in the work environment or just in general, I mean, just as a black woman, when they see a big Afro, it's like, oh my goodness, is that your natural hair? Or either when you come to work one day and you have braids and the previous day, you didn't. So it's just like, is that your hair? So how you can be more, um, uh, what is it? sensitive, right, to others, you know, that are not within your particular, you know, culture or, you know, um, ethnic, you know, space is just to, you know, just have a, you know, dialogue and just not to be the elephant in the room and have that taboo. So just, I would say, make it, you know, normalize the, you know, the discussions, you know, this is something that's, you know, Black women we face for years. And so I love that, you know, we're having, you know, these types of talks about that and having open dialogue. And so I think um, to answer that question, if they're saying, how can they not make, you know, the common mistakes is to, you know, address it like you would, you know, or, you know, um, like any other person that you would come into contact with. It's not something that should be taboo. Our hair shouldn't be taboo. I'd also say, um, if you're curious about it, try to figure out what that is in you that makes you curious. And like how someone wears their hair is how they express themselves. It's um, cultural identity. It also could just be convenience, but it shouldn't impact your view of them or your relationship with them. And, and, and if you feel so compelled to ask someone, you know, cause I've, I've someone has touched my hair without asking me. Um, I've been asked if that's my real hair. And frankly, it isn't anyone's business whether it's my real hair or not, right? And so I think we have to do a better job of respecting people's boundaries and their comfort zones and then do the internal work to figure out why are you so curious about it so in terms of like your your students like maybe that's the work if there's um if there are incidents i think of discrimination on your campus 
uh, for women of color or students of color around these kinds of things. Maybe it's approaching the Black Student Union to see if you could be an ally for them in establishing policies on campus to protect them and to make that less of a um, more controversial issue. And to piggyback on that as well, I was going to say a lot of times and what I found is career services, these kind of um, departments at universities are usually led by white men and white women. And so I would encourage you, especially on the academic university level, to make sure that those areas are having conversations that actually translate to students of color uh, in terms of thinking about careers, thinking about opportunities, going into these spaces. Are we having honest conversations that address discrimination um, and racism that many students of color are going to experience uh, when they go into their careers? Are we giving everyone the same advice in terms of how to prepare and making sure that our, you know, white men, white women also understand the experiences that their, um, their, their colleagues, their friends will be enduring. And so I think having those conversations on campus, especially as a, as a professor, you can start to encourage that dialogue within those departments that are already kind of bringing in individuals to make sure that the university is really addressing the issues and concerns um, that affect all students who are preparing to leave this academic setting and going into their careers as well. Um, I think two points I'd like to add kind of it's, uh, you know, kind of a different angle of being a professor myself, like, you know, reaching out and finding out what unique type of support each student needs, because it will vary. And it, you know, um, not always, but, you know, I mean, I have found that my students who are, you know, who have been historically or content, you know, are currently marginalized, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of extra burden they're carrying. So kind of reaching in, coming from a place of empathy to kind of find that out so that you can also grow as a mentor, as a professor. And then the other thing, you know, going back to kind of something India said in her presentation of always being the other, right? The sole other. And I mean, I, as an immigrant kid in rural North Carolina, I that definitely resonates, right? Like, a lot of people in the town I grew up in didn't even know where India was. They didn't even know that was a country, you know, couldn't put it on a map kind of thing. Like, thing, you know, things have changed a lot in the last few decades. But so then also like, like I now have a majority women of color research lab and there's, you know, kind of the strength and beauty in kind of just trying to change dynamics. So people aren't the sole others, you know, um, and I think there's just, so much, so many different ways that that diversity um, has value, but that's another way to, to kind of move away from people having to feel like the sole representatives or, you know, so isolated in, in their identities in these spaces. Thank you. Um, so we only have another minute or so left and I don't want to take anyone, take up any more time. But I think that I think that last question was really good to wrap us up. And I really want to thank everyone, India, Dr. Zoda, Dr. Williams, and Kareen for your time and your expertise and information on this issue. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So all uh, registrants will receive the recording and feel free to contact me or anyone on this panel and I'll include their information on a follow-up email um, about any questions that you may have. Um, thank you all so much. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you for organizing. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye guys. Bye.